you so very much to you and your students for coming to meet with us. Thank you for having us, Julia and Andrea as hosts. Um, welcome everyone who's here. We're going to kind of somewhat make this up as we go along. Um, so I'll provide a little bit of context and background and then maybe Julia will fill in a little bit. And I see there's still people coming in. We're, we'll also encourage people to turn their cameras on, yeah. especially the other Jonathan there, so we know who that is. <laughs> um, oh, there, there's another one. Yes. Okay. So you can redo your name too. That would probably be helpful. <laughs> um, so some of you may have seen me before. I mean, I know my students have, but um, as I did one of these coaching supervisions for, I don't know, two months ago, I think it was. And since you guys work a lot with adult development models, and that's my specialization in relation to leadership development, we, we had a fun conversation. And Julia said, oh, we'd love to have you back again. And then I got thinking and I thought, well, so I teach at the Norwegian University of science and technology in a master's in counseling program. And the main course that I teach is on coaching, taking kind of helping principles embedded in counseling in a broad sense and applying those in the field of organizational life through coaching. And in this class, uh, my students uh, have their own little business and they market their services and they're required to go out and coach some student leader and film it and come back and bring some of this film to class and we'll give feedback on that. That will happen in about two weeks. But as we were going along, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting for some of them who want to, to have a chance to engage in a conversation with a community of professional coaches? Because some of them are thinking, wow, coaching is kind of interesting. I'd like to do some more of that, but what's it like? What do people, how do they deal with issues of diversity? How do they have their day-to-day -day life? How do you get confident about being a coach? What's their journey been like? And so we thought it would be really cool to set up a session where we could enable some breakout sessions and just open conversation around these kind of issues and then come back and share and I'll, you know, I'll make something interesting up as we go along. Let's put it that way. So that's kind of context from my end. Julia, what what can you say from your end? Yeah, I just, um, I find it really exciting to put people from different places together and to, to build our skills around working globally and understanding contexts in different countries. Um, I'm particularly excited that we're gonna talk about things like inclusion and diversity and race and how it operates globally. Um, and to share some of um, our learning around that, but also to, to hear what it's like to be a coach in Norway or a developing coach and um, how that's working for you and what are the kinds of questions you might have. It's really, really wonderful to see you here. Thank you, students, for coming in particular. So yeah, I think let's play it by ear roll as we go, see what emerges, and I hand over to you, Jonathan. So in, in my classes, what we often do is just a quick check-in, just so everybody gets their voice in the room, and because many of us are new to each other, have a chance to just say hi, so kind of who are you, where are you living at the moment, and what are you doing in relation to coaching? without going on too long because we don't want to take up all the time. And so if we were to do the kind of Zoom orientation, I'll start with Jonathan and then Claudia, and I'll, I'll just kind of guide us around my screen. Lovely. Hi, everybody. It's very exciting to be with you all. It's an Australian accent you're hearing, although I'm speaking to you from Jerusalem. I've lived here for 30 years here in Israel. 
uh, my work includes coaching. Uh, it also includes mentoring, organizational development. It's very holistically oriented. And uh, my focus is on social and environmental impact. That's probably enough. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Great. And I just met Julia re very recently, so it's a very quick to jump into a conversation with all of you and with the organization and very exciting. And thanks for the invitation, Julia. Cool. So Claudia and then William. Thanks, Jonathan. And um, hi, everybody. So I'm one of the South Africans. I am based in Cape Town. And um, I'm actually an ontologically trained coach. Um, I have my own private practice and I'm relatively new to the field. I've been practicing since 2017. And um, I'm particularly interested in this conversation today to meet other people, to meet a wider community, but also to geek out on adult development. Um, it's another real interest of mine. It aligns beautifully with the ontological coaching approach, um, which is a transformational approach. And I did a course, I think about a year ago, it was actually during lockdown, uh, on Coaches Rising. And some of the faculty on that were Jennifer Garvey Berger and some other really interesting folk. And it really piqued my interest. And I'm super keen to learn more about it. And yeah, Jonathan, I watched the um, uh, workshop or supervision session that you did a few months ago. Really enjoyed that. Um, and yeah, I'm just um, really happy to be here. So thanks for having me. Great. William and then Todd. Yeah, my name is William and uh, I'm sitting here in Norway now um, at the university. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. It's really cool to be in a Zoom room with coaches from all over the world. It feels really, feels, you know, big and cool and stuff. And yeah, I'm, I'm here to, to kind of figure more out like, what is it like to be a coach and you know what what are your guys experience around that and hopefully come with some good questions and and gather some uh, some knowledge around you know what it's like to be a coach i'm going to give just a quick insert just when you were mentioning cloudy adult development so so those of you know that the students in my class all get exposed to adult development in relation to this. So they're familiar with Keegan's theory, a little bit Bill Torberts and so on. So they have some knowledge of these things. So Todd and then Jimmy. Hi everybody, I'm Todd Iarusi. I'm a, a US-based leadership and executive coach with a focus on maturity work. And I use Aphoria's AIM assessment with every leader that I work with and one-on-one -on -one and uh, team settings, and I've been on running my own practice for five years and in the leadership world for about eight or nine years. And I have at this point more questions than answers about how to continue to infuse adult development theory and maturity work into coaching and, and organizational work. So I'm really happy to be here today. Great. Jimmy and then Natasha. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Jimmy Canile. I live here in Cape Town, originally from Soweto. I've uh, been in the coaching uh, space for a while and uh, trained as an integral coach through uh, the, the, the coaching center. And I found the advert trend when uh, through my emails, I, I think I've had registered for some other trainings before with Euphoria and I had not been able to attend. And today I'm blessed that my family from Norway is here. And uh, so I'm really excited to learn how is coaching happening in, in, in Scandinavia. Uh, I lived in Bergen for two years and recently had visited Bremen in, in, uh, in, in Oslo. Uh, so I'm still really excited that my family is here. So great uh, with that, I'm yeah, cool. Looking forward to learning to get today. Great, Jimmy. Okay, Natasha and then Alistair. Yes. Hello, my name is Natasha. I'm from, I'm here in Norway. I'm Jonathan students on coaching and counseling program. It's a great pleasure being here because it's a, I like how we're working. It's so practical subject, what we're dealing with. And we could impose, we could write some questions. And one of the questions was a wish I sent to Jonathan, 
where can we learn more about coaching? Is there a special forum? Because I felt as if the more I read and practice, there are a lot of questions that probably when I'm done with this uh, program, then I have nobody to ask or to connect with. And this was a great opportunity to be part of this and learn from you people who are more experienced in coaching. And I would love to learn how you each of you work differently with this coaching because some are on business, others work on organization and personal one-on-one. -on -one. So I, I would love to hear from different views how you apply coaching. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Alistair and then Tilda. Um, hi everyone. My name is Alistair. I am based in Cape Town, South Africa. I was born in Zimbabwe, which is a country next to South Africa. I left the finance world in April to become a coach. I, I am supposed to be a diversity and inclusion coach uh, specializing on race, but um, I'm finding that leaders in South Africa are not willing to look into the issue or you know, resolve the issue. So I'm just doing one-on-one -on -one coaching in the meantime. And I'd just like to um, also hear what your thoughts are on what, what makes leaders from different parts of the world be willing to engage in such topics um, and others not, that kind of stuff. So that's why I'm on the call. Thanks. I was just saying, you should have just been in the class I was doing right up until the hour here which was around uh, multicultural and feminism and postmodern issues around council. We we're talking about diversity and those kind of issues for three hours in the class just before this. So maybe some of that will spill over. Okay, Tilda and then El, El Mayan. Hello, my name is Tilda and I'm a master's student. I'm uh, very interested in creative methods in coaching and counseling. Uh, and recently I'm thinking about the future. So I hope for some inspiration here. Great, Elmaine and then Simon. Thank you, my name is Elmaine Solons. I'm in Gauteng, located in Gauteng in South Africa. Also do work in the Northwestern province. And I work um, in the space of learning and development talent management, and in terms of coaching, wellness coaching, interested in identity, maturity, and um, existential work that uh, our wonderful Julia, she is a lot of info with us, and just passionate about working with people and very privileged to be here with you, so thank you. Great, Simon and then Rita. Hello, uh, <clears throat> my name is Simon. Um, well, I'm a student of uh, Johnson. I, um, I live in Norway, obviously, and um, well, I'm excited to be here, I think. And um, I have my second uh, coaching session tomorrow. So I think this is a good warm up. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay, Rita and then Adam. Hello. Uh, I'm also one of Jonathan's students. Um, I'm just curious about the entire coaching scene, to be honest. Uh, I don't know where this path is going to take me yet. So I'm having all my options open, I guess. So, yeah. But I, I would also mention that Rita is looking into coaching in relation to esports. I think it's a really fascinating topic for her master's thesis. So there's a whole world of coaching possibilities out there in that. So. Okay, Adam and then Frida. Yes, hi everybody. Um, I am a student of Julia's. Um, so um, I, I work in the field also of, of learning and development for, for a, a, a media company in Cape Town. Um, I, I, I don't uh, do a huge amount of coaching, but I find increasingly uh, I am in the sense uh, an informal coach in the sense of being a sounding board uh, for, for many executives across the company uh, around uh, what to do, where to go, how to organize ourselves. 
Um, yeah, and it's great to be here with all of you. Very nice. Great. Frida and then Christina. Hi, my name is Rushida, one of Jonathan's students sitting in Norway. Um, I am wondering how to deal with diversity or like cultural issues uh, or topics uh, because I that um, came up as a topic uh, in my second coaching session. So I just, yes, I'm really excited to hear more about that. And I also writing my master's thesis on psychological safety and knowledge sharing in organizations. Cool. Okay, Christina and then Megan. Hi, I'm same as me, Christine. Um, I am a coach, a mentor, and organization development practitioner, mainly working at the moment in, in nonprofit organizations. And it was fascinating for me, well, the coincidence, on Friday, I was in a contracting session with the CEO of an NGO, a global one, and the contracting of where the coaching was going was going into adult development. So I know about Keegan, I've worked a lot of Keegan, but I feel that I would love to expand my knowledge to be able to support this particular leader, because I think Keegan has a view and they, they are wider views in Keegan. And um, yeah, my one memory of Norway is the Lufton Islands. I had a wonderful experience there. I remember being freezing cold on the side of the side of the road, waiting for a bus or accommodation, and somebody offered me a bottle of vodka. So it was good. <laughs> Great. Uh, I'm going to show screen share a picture from because I spent my summer holiday in Lofoten this year. <laughs> I love talking. Um, and so for, for those of you who uh, don't know what she's talking about, am I able to screen share here? Yeah. No. Some... No, no. Yeah, you go. There you go. It's done. No, it still said just like, okay, now I can. Okay, just, just so you get an idea, this is what it looks like in Lofoten. Wow, that's beautiful. And it's lovely. And the people are lovely there as well. And, and just imagine this is well above the Arctic Circle. Wow. So it was gorgeous. Okay, so Megan and then Maria. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Megan. I'm here in the US. I'm a US based coach and leadership development trainer. Um, I'm on the West Coast here in Oakland, California. It's six o'clock in the morning. So if I look like I'm not awake, I'm not away. Um, and I do a lot of work uh, in organizations, helping people and organizations mature. Um, my specialty is I really love working with emerging leaders and mid-level talent. Um, my orientation is trying to influence change and transformation and fulfillment and joy just bottoms up. Um, and I do some work in DEI, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion with a white cohort. And uh, it is uh, very vulnerable, uh, difficult work. And I'm meeting a lot of resistance. Um, I'm feeling that here in the US, persons are starting to treat it um, like a fad. It was really an imperative this summer. And, um, just like we, we, we have a lot of catch up work to do. And, um, so it's particularly feels particularly painful at the moment. So, um, yeah, I would love to share just how people are doing this work with reluctant I, I, leadership. Yeah. I, I can imagine I hear a lot from my colleagues in the U S about the sensitivity of it. And, and I spent some time in Alameda. So I, I know close. Oakland relatively well. Okay, Maria, then you. Yeah, my name is Marie. Um, I'm a student of Jonathan as well. Um, and I'm very interested in development, um, especially how you as coaches um, work with your own development. That's something I'm interested in hearing about today. Mm. Great, Hugh and then Dan. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hugh, and I work in a financial services company in a business strategy and resilience role, but I also coach internally. So I get to sit on the fence between being part of teams and coaching them at the same time, which is always lots of fun. And I'm based here in Johannesburg, South Africa. Great, Dan, and then Vershanya. Mm, I hope I pronounced that right. Okay, Dan. Hi, uh, hello. Good, good to be here. I'm Dan Brown. I'm from the states. I'm based in Washington D.C. Um, I'm a leadership coach, a product of Georgetown University's leadership coaching program, and work exclusively with um, leaders in senior and mid-level positions, whether it's in federal government here in the states or in commercial enterprise, and have been uh, steeped in adult development since 2011. Um, and have the good fortune of working closely with some of the providers of the assessments that um, measure stages of development, getting to debrief those assessments with clients is a real joy. And I'm in the process now of launching a nonprofit in the States called Coaching for Justice, which will have as its mission um, providing a curriculum of study for leadership coaches uh, so that they can be more capable and equipped to coach across uh, the, uh, the divide of um, racial injustice. So it's good work. Uh, we're soon to launch our program. So anyone who's interested in the States, uh, do let me know. Great to be here. Sorry, I can't be on camera as much. I'm just not in a good setting for it. <laughs> okay, but the flowers look nice in your background. <laughs> okay, thanks. You can enjoy the flowers, Jonathan. Good. Okay, Vershana. Hi, everybody. My name is Vershana. I'm an industrial psychology intern. I'm based in South Africa, Gauteng. And I needed coaching hours for my internship, so somebody passed this link along. And I'm so glad that I can learn from the experts and see where the field of coaching is going. Okay, cool. Andrea, you should say something about yourself. Sure. Hi. So I'm part of the internal team at Aphoria Partners. Um, I'm a relatively new coach and Enneagram practitioner. Um, and I came from a career in the nonprofit sector, mostly working with young women. So I'm still kind of finding my own way with coaching. Um, yeah, and it's great to be in the Zoom room with all of you. And how would you introduce yourself, Julia? I would just say um, I'm so excited to see the breadth of people here. And I'm a person that likes exciting new ideas. And I feel like I might be getting a few today. And I'm a coach and ex existential person. I work internally at Euphoria. And I'm really interested in the relationship between maturity and capacity for inclusion and diversity. And I'm really interested in the social um, justice areas around difference. And I love the work of Steve Beaton. Um, I give a little bit of uh, context. So I am, um... Yeah, I spent some time 20 some years ago at Gonzaga University. So those of you in the US or people that know basketball know where that is. And one of the privileges I had was a friend of mine asked me to teach a leadership and diversity course. And it was so amazing to learn from these students who were from whether it was the Philippines or Central America or Native Americans or African American. It was a very diverse group. And just learning from the, the tiny day-to-day -day things that went on in their life that I would never have thought of as being part of someone's experience was really enriching for me. So while I haven't done a lot of uh, DEI type of work, I certainly got sensitized to it then and that stuck with me. What I've done a lot more of is adult development work. I got into that in the mid 90s, um, have known many of those people for 20 years or more. And yeah, have way too much I could say about that. So 
what we want to do, and Julia, I hear you're running the Zoom room, so we're going to set up four rooms so that we can have people go in and out as they please. That's the idea. The, the way we want to do this is to, to get us going into smaller conversations is my students suggested four different topics. Um, mm -hmm. And we had kind of gone over these, the, the diversity issue, um, the idea of what is it like just to be a coach day to day? Um, how do you develop confidence as a coach to handle new topics and clients? And, and maybe this is related a little bit to how have coaches evolved on their own developmental journey? How do you continue that? How do you kind of build your practice up? Um, and what we thought we would do is simply set up Zoom rooms that you can kind of go in and out of as you please and allow people to mingle and just discuss different topics around these themes for the next, oh, let's say half an hour or so. And then we'll come back and kind of take the temperature of things and just see what themes have come up, how might we want to share and discuss and have perspectives on those. So sound like a plan? Sounds great. Okay. So you are the master of the Zoom rooms, Julia. Okay, so what happens is you get you get invited to choose from the four. Why is it not doing this? Right. Okay, I'm gonna just reset it up again. Um, oh, it came uh, in and disappeared. <laughs> so did they, oh, did they, um, did it work for you? Are you, uh, oh, okay. okay. Now, now I, I see it, now I see it, yeah. And you can just join one of the four. Okay, so we'll, we'll kind of jump in um back go back and forth but in half an hour or so we'll kind of take the temperature and call people back so you, you can be here in the main room you can jump into one of the rooms you can get bored and decide you want to jump into another room get to meet new people make new friends Okay, Julia, I'm being a doofus here, but how do you join? I'm clicking on the title I want. I want to go on building confidence, but it's not letting me do anything. To, to the right of that, it has a button that says oh, a join. Button. You have to click on that. Thank you. you have to click okay. on that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Wow. People are interested in the rest, huh? Yeah. And the developmental journey, but that, that's good. Developmental journey, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. Adam and Claudia are really interested in building confidence with each other. And <laughs> Tilda's busy for a moment. We're not sure where she's going. We need to to get a coffee. It's such yeah, fun to right. have such a broad range of people. I thought it was just great having everybody introduce themselves and just getting to hear. You learned so much hearing all the introductions even. Yeah, you did. Yeah, that was a great idea. Mm -hmm. Really. And um, often it can feel like a waste of time, but it really didn't feel like that mm -hmm. at all. I just had the sense that there, were, like you said, there were some new people in your community community that were first time there and and there's I don't know half a dozen of my students who showed up and so just for them they get a chance to get a feeling of people and then your people get a chance to get a feeling for the students in these coaching us 
Yes, I learned a lot within this very short time because all the time when I'm thinking about coaching, for me, it was like coaching leadership development or adult development. But today I'm seeing coaching in cultural context that way, more deeper. And then I connected coaching with the adult development theory when I'm looking at Egel and Kuhne, Kuhet on the map, for example, whereby I, I spoke in my group, leadership from one is level one is the is the lowest and five is the highest so i was thinking when we talk about leadership and coaching at working place probably the person we think is at level four leadership level at the highest level when it comes to cultural martyr probably they are found on level two because they don't take perspective at the diversity level in, for example, meeting board when they're on the decision-making process. They'll be maybe focusing on their own type of people and maybe undermining taking uh, feedback from other people, from other races. For example, if someone overlook one race from the other, then there is a problem there, this balance between cultural context and leadership adult development. It was so interesting. It, it makes me think of um, a clip that I've used sometimes from the film Invictus, where um, Nelson Mandela goes out because the sports committee is about to change the name of the Springboks and take their colors away. And he goes out and says, no, 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 you can't do that. You know, because he had that broader awareness. And it's a good example of how those issues play out, both cultural diversity and developmental ones. Cool. What else did people have to share? Um, well, I, I can share what um, Adam and I were chatting about how to develop confidence as a coach. We had a very rich chat about that and realized we talked a lot about the presence that we cultivate and that enables us to hold a space both for ourselves and for a uh, coachee. And then um, when we were joined in the chat by William and Rita and um, uh, somebody else, I'm just trying to, I mean, we then realized that some the, the, the theme of presence had been coming up in one of the other rooms as well and just how important this is. And yeah, it can mean different things, of course, but um, as part of presence, Adam and I were talking about the practice of self-observation, really being able to see yourself as clearly as you're observing your client in order to, to understand what you're creating, how you're generating and contributing to the process. Um, so yeah, that was, that was just a theme that came up for us. Cool, well, it brings up lots of stuff. Are there some other comments around that theme, other perspectives of, on it? There's many layers to it. Hmm. William, I'm sure you have something you could say. All right, yeah. I can add. Um, William, you go. Yeah, I can, I guess you could say something, you know. Um, yeah, we also spoke about, you know, uh, presence, and uh, kind of being in the room with the client, but also this um, self-awareness and, you know, how do you deal, how do you deal with yourself as a coach, as well as dealing with the client. But it was uh, Jonathan who mentioned that you can also become, or you have to be aware that you don't become too self-obsessed as well, because we are here to, you know, to help, the, to help the clients and kind of, this balancing act between, you know, your self-awareness and awareness of, of your journey as a coach and what the client's situation. And uh, yeah, so those were some reflections from some of the conversations we had. Could I pop in a voice here? I'm just curious, did any of you um, wonder um, about your, your presence in a particular race? So like, what is it like for people to look at me as a white person or a black person or an Indian person? 
What does my race do to my presence? Did, did anybody ask those kinds of questions? Just curious, you know, when you live in a, a quite a homogenous society or you only have people that you coach with the same kind of color, then you, you get a bit, um, you, you lose consciousness around that, but obviously it's going to impact on the relationship in some way. And wouldn't that be really interesting to find out how? I would, I would build on that uh, by saying that when I'm coaching someone who identifies different from me, um, it's, it's always been a good opening for psychological safety to raise that early in the coaching relationship. So I might say something like, you know, how do you identify? And the person might say, you know, I identify as a, a black woman uh, with, you know, roots in indigenous culture, let's just say. So it happens one of my clients does identify that way, new client. And so I said, you know, well, well, I identify as a white male and, you know, what does that bring up for you in our work together, our differences? How do, how do our differences play out? And you're imagining our working together. And, you know, it just opens up some space to explore. And uh, occasionally, you know, somebody who's different from me, particularly if it's a black person in our culture in the United States, uh, I might get, well, I wasn't sure if I could trust you. Okay, well, let's explore that. Mm. So mm. I think that, I think the coaching model um, at least the one that I grew up with is based on meet the clients where they are, which is all well and good. Uh, but if we're going to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, then I think the model has to make room for activism. And by that, I mean that, you know, particularly as a white coach or any coach of any color for that matter, to take a position that I'm going to ensure that diversity, equity, and inclusion becomes part of this conversation whether the client raises it or doesn't. So I, uh, I think that's really important. Yeah, it's absolutely critical in the South African context, Dan, and I, I love the, the way you talk about that. William, Thank you. you had your hand up for a second there. Uh, yeah, because um, I did some coaching, practice coaching, and uh, I had a client from a completely you know different culture other side of the world been living there for most of his life and now in Norway and the client brought up at, at one stage in the conversation the client brought up a issue revolving around uh, race and culture and I felt um, I felt it was a little bit uncomfortable because I felt that this is so out of my depth to kind of go into these sort of things and because uh, how can I, you know, understand um, his situation? And but then eventually the client kind of, you know, just kind of pushed it away. Like it's, it's not that important. You know, we can go ahead with what we were actually what was the main focus of the coaching. Uh, but I regret or I can't say I regret. But if I could have done it again, I would have probably tried to to give that. Um, area more focus in the conversation and uh, and discovered more. I heard two things, and, and I see Frida's got a response too, but I think that just acknowledging and raising it, you know, may build some trust. Simply the person can see you're, you're open about wrestling with it a little, even if you're not able to engage it in a good way, that you go some ways towards that. Frida? Yeah, just uh, started to think about uh, my coaching session when William talked about his, uh, because uh, uh, mm, also thinking about the English speaking here, but I uh, saw the situation as me and another uh, woman, same thing, same culture, and then suddenly... I got surprised uh, by 
her talking about this another culture and you guys in Norway, like something different from her. And I just sat there and I didn't dare to ask more about it. I just. Yeah, I, I was uh, like, uh, I didn't expect that coming up, the cultural thing. Um, and I didn't, uh, yeah, I felt not prepared at all. If that's something to be, if it's able to be prepared. So, uh, yeah. But I think it, it raised a really good question. Uh, my friend, Gonzaga, who had me teach the diversity class was a, uh, saying often that to him diversity and is not about skin color it, it's much deeper and many more forms of diversity that we can encounter or difference or otherness so that's a good example where you don't see it in an explicit way but then it shows up suddenly and you didn't notice it in some way and how do you deal with that yeah um I, if I can add, um, William, I really liked what you said uh, about your um, hesitation. You realized that you didn't necessarily understand the background of this person and the context and what they were dealing with. And um, I, for me, that's a, what, what sort of came to mind that uh, privilege can create the illusion of relevance. Like if we come from a privileged background, like I'm, I'm a bit older, I'm a male, I'm white, so I kind of have all these attributes of power and, and knowledge attached to me. And then in the relationship, it, 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 this can be a kind of an assumption who frames what comes up, what, what counts as uh, true, uh, et cetera, uh, moving into asking for advice rather than exploration. And, um, and it's very comfortable to, for me to be in that role. And so I think according to what's going on in the conversation, and it, it, it's about um, many dimensions. It, it can be about gen gender, sorry, gender, age, uh, ethnic background, uh, religion, many different dimensions. Um, but for me, part of it is also sort of managing how I, you know, use my power, um, the, the way I might frame something in a tentative way, or use a phrase like I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, or e even that, that kind of thing, whereas with someone, you know, with a, a male from my background, my age, who's very, very certain about themselves, you know, I may, may need to take uh, Kafka's uh, ice pick. Uh, Franz Kafka has an image of an ice pick uh, to open someone's thinking bit of a violent image actually thinking about it but anyway um and I might need to be quite almost sort of confrontational which even then I can frame in a how can I say an empathetic fashion um but uh anyway so that I think there's two dimensions what one is around recognizing our ability to literally understand someone from a different background understand their experience um, and then the other is how we um, manage our power in the relationship of dialogue. And John, oh, Jonathan, can I respond to that? Uh, is that okay, Jonathan? Yes. Yeah, I think you're touching on something that again, Adam and I talked about, which is the importance of having I mean, if you're doing coach training and you, you, you have an awareness of, of certain standards of, and there are regulatory bodies that look for this, you know, such as the ICF or, or many others, and they're not necessarily the only way to adhere, learn how to practice to certain standards of respect, care, um, and also, as you said, not giving advice, but actually exploring with your clients. But I think having a, a framework that allows you to practice that quite explicitly is really important. Um, it can just be really helpful, I think, because we're talking about learning and, and coaching, I, to actually learn how to do that. And there are many of the coaching approaches that really do help you to 
frame things in a way that are um, you can that, that that don't have that power implicit in it that you are constantly respectful of your your coachee that you're not making assumptions and that you are letting them lead the process as well and I think um, I don't know what the feeling this is the first time I've been on a call with Julia but I don't know what the feeling about the ICF is but I'm a big believer in them and they do champion all of those kinds of standards of those of practice um, so I just wanted to raise that because I think it's an important consideration um, that we do um, have standards of how, how we work as coaches because we're entering a, a space where there are so many things that can can go wrong and yeah especially when we're dealing with with these sensitive issues which we're talking about such as diversity and race and power. Two, two things occur to me one is I, I know somebody in Latvia who has been on the committee that develop the criteria for evaluating the different levels of coaching in ICF. And I was really impressed with the care and thoroughness with which they're looking for evidence of skillfulness in some of those very difficult, subtle issues of how to handle different kinds of conversations. The, the second thing that I, I thought about was now, I've used Keegan and Leahy's notion of deconstructive feedback, which really is saying that even in trying to give constructive criticism, um, people often start with an assumption that, well, I know something and you don't, and I'm going to inform you. And, you know, there's that whole dynamic that happens because of that. And in the deconstructive approach, it's much more, hmm. I know something and I see that there's something different going on here and let's see what we can learn together about it. So those kinds of stances or other tools are really helpful to scaffold our performance and our ability to handle difficult and diverse situations. Mm. Yeah, and I just like to throw something in there and that is that um, until we've done our own work around race, and I don't think that's it's possible for us to ever do it properly, but um, to <clears throat> to acknowledge who we are, our whiteness, our blackness, our brownness, whatever. Until we've done our own work, um, we're always going to feel unsafe and insecure, and um, and and hope that tools will save us. Um, but the truth of the matter is that um, it's really personal. And it's really painful. And if you don't do it, you can't expect to work effectively around this. Is is my hard line on the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta do it. And and so it's true. And I look at what are the contexts within which we have the opportunity to do it. You know, in certain context, oh, somebody's excited there. <laughs> now that's what the mute button's for. I know, I just wished um, it on because so, I wanted to say something. <laughs> well, maybe just in a second here. So I see we have a queue. We have Frida and then Alistair have their hands up. Frida? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah I just I was just thinking about if it's um, why. Uh, am I scared of asking questions to my client when I know that I am a kind person, if you know what I mean? In a, or like in a coaching session like this, I sit there and just, I don't want to be like not kind. And, and it, is it then possible to be too, uh, no, I, um, too like too it. careful, too careful, and just to escape in, yeah. So Frida's situation is so interesting <laughs> because I, it was so interesting in such a way that you say you're working with someone you actually thought the person was Norwegian like yourself, and suddenly the person brings up the race issues, and 
I can say in my working situation, not related to coaching, but I work with people. And sometimes I work with foreigners because of my language, then we speak the same language and people, I work with some people in Africa, I think we're very good to categorize, to know you are from East, you're from West. I don't know how they do it, but I would come there and client will reject to work with me because I look different from them and I come from another region. But there's a way you can work with people in that kind of situation because if you're going to make money, you don't want to lose this client. You want to work with them. And at the same time, you don't want to stop yourself from doing your job. So you have to find a ways of building trust and to make sure they know what your intentions are, what you're going to work, what your job is and what you're, you're there for, what you can offer them. So it's about creating this kind of safety and and also tell them if there's anything they they want to talk about, they can share with you. Just about telling, creating trust, building trust, and also communicate your intentions, and they know what you are going to work with, or which areas you want to touch, or what they can open up with you. I think it's kind of it has worked for me, or else I would have lost a lot of clients because I don't come from their countries. And <laughs> it's... Yeah. So I think that's part of negotiating, you know, designing the alliance, negotiating the relationship. So now we've got Alistair and then Jimmy. Yeah. Thanks. Um, on the coaching side of things, um, I've just shared in the chat um, what the ICF has done to marry all their core competencies to DNI. Um, they did like, I think, after the whole George Floyd murder. Um, so, but my interest is in adult development. Um, it's asking, what does adult development theory say about the importance of DNI work? Because in my experience, I strongly feel that leaders don't care about this DNI thing. Um, I was in another community and somebody actually said even Hitler was post-con, right? So it could be beneficial for people to not have a diverse workforce or an inclusive workforce, right? So I'm, I'm trying to understand what does adult development theory say about the importance of this particular topic? Because you can be post-con, but then when it comes to issues of race, which something I think Natasha said in our group, you are not, you're conventional when it comes to dealing with difference. You know, that's kind of way I'm really trying to understand the stuff. And, and I would say that there's not necessarily a stance that adult development has per se, but I think there are a number of really rich questions around this. So one of the things I've referenced sometimes for my students is um, a, a paper that some colleagues of mine wrote about Anders Breivik, who is a mass murderer in Norway. Yeah. Fairly high action logics, fairly high level of thinking, but really thinking about bad shit. You know, so there, there is no guarantee that complexity equals kind of ethical maturity. You know, and this gets into like Wilbur's notions of different lines of development. It's not that there is just some generic development that happens to include all, all the aspects at, at once. There's many different uh, facets that each have their own kind of line of development in certain ways. Now, in relation to the, the DEI work, I was listening to a podcast a friend of mine does on leadership issues, and he was talking to somebody in this field, and one of the things they said is there's, you know, a lot of research that says you get higher performing teams with more diversity, and then there's research that says, well, not always, and what's going on? And they say, well, if you don't know how to make use of the diversity, if you just have it in a token way, but don't actually understand how to enable the diverse perspectives to question assumptions, to 
you know, help the kind of inquiry to deepen and broaden this. So my perspective is that the way diversity can support development is that it can help us widen and deepen our own sets of assumptions about reality and our experience and our identity. And that it can be very rich, but it requires good process, trust, safety, scaffolding, all those kind of things. So I'm curious what others think about that question. I'd be glad to share a couple of things. Um, from a philosophical point of view, I think it's how I distinguish at least between diversity and pluralism. And um, diversity is kind of a fact. You can check it empirically whether there's diversity there, but pluralism is the attitude to that diversity and plural, pluralism um, celebrates the diversity. So you can't have pluralism unless you've got diversity, but you can have diversity without pluralism and then your diversity becomes it's a problem. Um, you might want to get rid of it, et cetera, et cetera. So there's just from a conceptual point of view. And um, I don't think there's a magic bullet how to encourage people to have uh, pluralism as a value or an orientation, but at least to distinguish between the two. Um, um, Julie, you said something earlier that I, I love the phrase, uh, you know, tools won't help us if we haven't done the work. And um, I, in my work in um, uh, leadership development, I, I use, um, I've worked a lot with young people um, who sometimes have very strong ambitions about wanting to address a social problem that they actually don't have very much exposure to or experience with. And there's a very nice um, phrase called, um, now I'm going to forget it, of course. Um, there we go. The meaning of the phrase is to uh, be uh, embedded in the problem to sort of uh, soak yourself in the problem. I'll think of the actual term in a bit and I'll put it in the chat, but um, to, to kind of um, uh, get exposed to the problem, either to the problem or people working on the problem. And I wanna make the parallel here that um, uh, the, the issue that was raised earlier about how do we each individually deal with issues around uh, race or, or different diversity, that I think some of that work is not just in our minds and in our hearts, actually in our lives. And so, especially for the, the students here in the group, um, I, I would encourage you to think about uh, what's in your diary? Uh, wh what are the ways that you're exposing yourselves to diversity of people, of uh, settings, um, that you'll have even small, um, small um, fragments of experience through which you can relate to other people's maybe much larger experience. But uh, if, you've, if you're coaching someone who's working in an organizational setting, you've never actually worked in an organizational setting, then you don't have even the fragments of lived experience through which to extrapolate and understand their the challenges that they're facing and therefore the the personal challenges that they're facing that that are being brought into their lives because of the, what's going on in the external world so i would i, I think this this uh concept which i'm going to look up in a moment and put it in the chat the actual term but um to build out a diverse resume of experiences, I think is a really important part so that you can bring that richness um, into, into your work in terms of sensitivity and, and empathy, because empathy is, is a personal and psychological orientation and it's maybe an ethical orientation, but I, I do believe that our life experiences can also populate that and, and help it be richer and more accurate and uh, more alert. Cool. If, um, sorry, Jonathan, can I pop in? Is there a queue? No, there's no queue at the moment. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I mean, one of the things that we, we look at in, um, in adult development is, because um, we, of course, have 
got that adult development process, but we've mixed it in with the work of Steve B. Cohen, African existential thinker. And so the thing is to have a rich and diverse inner world. So, you know, Yonatan is talking about external experiences that help cultivate aspects of yourself, a rich and diverse self that is um, possibly even paradoxical um, and that, that holds many identities. And so it kind of means you have to go into a post-conventional space where inside of you, you have many identities, not just one or two. And once you've got this rich inner world, then you can deal more evenly with a rich external world because you've got the internal objects that can help sense making and access. It's kind of how we think about it in, in adult development. Yeah, and I I'm mean, just... that makes sense to me because I think part of what I sense is possible is when you encounter any kind of otherness, how do you model it? How do you build a relationship to it rather than being subject to it or subject to whatever it triggers in you? So having <laughs> some process to build that inner richness, of course, it expands the consciousness. And any of that kind of expansion will kind of force you to take a perspective on your own sense of identity in a way, which will be a developmental type of move. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can carry on. A, there's another very interesting thing, if it, unless I'm hogging the show. And I think Christine wanted to talk, and then a dog barked, and that prohibited her from speaking ever again. And, and, and that's what I wanted to, to raise. <laughs> and when Christine's dog barked, uh, Alistair's hand was up. So I thought uh, this white uh, pe person's dog is barking too, because now there's a black person on the screen, you know? Mm -hmm. And because whenever we worked, uh, and particularly grew up in Soweto, we, we say when you walk past a white person's house, the dogs will bark because you're yeah. black, you know? So, so the, it was just such a, an interesting light moment. I thought I would bring that up. That's why I had my hand up at the time, but uh, it's you. a very show. It's very true for South Africa with white people's dogs. It, I have to say it was very interesting for me when Julia started out with that video and I looked at that and I thought, oh, that's Moro Pang. I've been there. That was really cool. Alistair, did, did you get to say what you wanted to say? Yeah, I, I, that was a long time ago when I raised oh. my hand. But uh, since I'm on the mic now, um, <laughs> I'm facing resistance from, um, from clients, particularly with the levels of maturity. People, people are cool with the Enneagram, but when you, when you tell someone that they're not, well, technically as mature as they think they are, um, how, do we, how do we navigate that, that conversation? Mm. <laughs> I, would, I would love to answer that one because I had a hell of a session today around that. Um, it was with a person who'd actually done a lot of work, but maybe some elements of the work had not been done. And this person was in a very stressful situation, so might have suffered a level of what we call fallback. So they'd gone back to a previous version of themselves under stress. And um, usually I have a lot of answers around this. Stuff like, how did you do the assessment? Are you under stress? And today I just thought, no, this person feels like they know their stuff and I'm not going to argue. And um, because, you know, you can get into a position where you have to de defend uh, an assessment. And, and who wants to do that? Um, and who wants to, yeah, it gets, it gets, like complicated and odd so i actually well, let yeah 
Oh, go ahead, finish up, and then but, I was going to. No, I actually let the person that talked themselves into the same score without me being involved at all. And I thought, why have I not done this before? How many years have I been saying, well, how did you do the assessment? No, 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 no. But actually <laughs> trusting that people find their place there. And if they are defending hugely, like lots of people do, that's interesting too. Um, anyway, I just wanted to share that. Now I'm gonna shut up. Well, I, I was just thinking, cause this came out, I had somebody approach me out of the blue and we had a call yesterday. She's a Chinese woman who's um, worked and been educated, you know, with Keegan in Boston and she's now at Berkeley and she's been to Stockholm and Paris. And, and she was developing or expanding her coaching framework. And as we were talking, I was making this distinction. I've got a note because I want to write a blog about it. I think there's, as we talk about fallback, we talk about how do we relate differences in performance to developmental assessment. And I think that there's a couple of key distinctions. And, and one is that many of these developmental assessments are aimed to get at our meaning making process. How do we construct a sense of identity, a sense of the world? How do we structure that and so on? And that seemed to be relatively stable. However, what is much less stable and the whole line of developmental psychology coming through um, Kohlberg and Fisher and Commons and these people says that performance is variable. That's what we know about development but it's the key word is performance. So the difference between what we can think and what we do in a given moment, in a given context, mm -hmm. there can be a big gap between. And so separating out a person's performance in a given moment from their ability to reflect on or make meaning of it can be a useful way to distinguish why does this assessment say this about me when this is happening. That's useful. Thank you. Uh, it, it is, and I'll just chip in a little something, an observation that I've had on that point, Jonathan. I, I oftentimes debrief the Leadership Circle Profile 360 uh, with the advantage of having uh, also at my side, the same client's global leadership profile, which measures their meaning making. And uh, there have been occasions where there's a, a rather large and interesting gap between their self-assessment on the leadership profile mm -hmm. and the assessment of others. And their self-assessment really kind of matches up with their epistemic um, capabilities as reported by the global leadership profile but they're not uh, closing the gap that you just mentioned. So it's a very fruitful place to explore. And it may be a place on any kind of a 360 that's providing you know, uh, a gap analysis between the self-assessment and the assessment of others. So I, I see that repeatedly. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's a very rich territory. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I'm, my next call in 20 minutes is with Bob and Bill and the Leadership Circle Gang, and I've been using that for 16 years now. And, and one of the things I see is this gap between self and other scores, which can go either way. And there's mm -hmm. all sorts of different kind of contextual things. So in, in coaching conversations, I find it so rich because you have to say, well, here's data about how a person thinks about themselves and how other people perceive them, but how others perceive them is influenced by the context, norms, expectations, and how does a person make, make meaning out of that data about other people's perceptions? It's so rich and complex. Yeah, and just the other side of the complexity is the, um, the, re the frame of reference of the evaluators of the 360. You know, It's not yeah. like they're all coming from the same um, meaning-making system or the same level of development. So it's, you know, all to say, really have to take all of these assessments with a huge grain of salt. Yeah. So uh, we had a conversation just the other day with somebody who had a very creative profile. 
But when you talk to them, you, you got the clear picture that they weren't a complex thinker or mature even. It's just that they knew how to be good with the people in their con, and those people just liked them, and so they gave them all these good scores. Yeah. It didn't mean they actually performed there. <laughs> or there's just a great match between uh, the job and, and the person, you know? So yeah. take so somebody who's, you know, scores yeah. an achiever, let's say, or the self-determined, yeah. depending on your lexicon stage of yeah. development. Um, they could have, you know, a huge bloom on the creative side. Um, and it's because there's a great match. They're not really even yeah. called to encounter any kind of complexity in their role. Yeah. yeah. What I find interesting is um, some assessments are very aspirational versus other ones. And um, when you come across a senior executive who's had a lot of assessments over their time, then they can often bring up a lot of um, artillery to, um, to support whatever view. Um, and, and I find it so curious, having done a number of assessments, uh, especially the maturity ones, I know where I land on some. So some I land two stages below where I land on others. And, um, and that's also amusing. It's all this very strange consensus reality about what maturity oh. at each stage looks like. Oh. So I'll make a very small comment and then I want to see what Jonathan has to say. But yeah. it's because I work and I know most of the people doing these assessments, if Suzanne and Bill and um, the oh. electrical gang and Keegan and all these. What I've learned is that understanding what is the construct that is being assessed is yeah. key to understanding how differences in scores will show up. Jonathan? Yeah. I'm really curious um, about the use of the term maturity because uh, maturity tends to be, well, at least I think of it, my association is that it's somewhat uh, linear and it, it's, uh, it's normative at, at some base to the extent at least that maturity typically comes from childhood through to adulthood and we've, we still tend to think of adult as somehow more fully people than a younger person, the younger person, you know, we, we, we have rights and everything, but they're on the way to becoming something. Um, the, the other, the alternative kind of discourse, which I tend to use more, is about different intelligences. And that, so something like um, Myers-Briggs, which many times people, when I've worked with it, tend to feel like boxed and, and uh that you're talking about the maturity in different, but once you talk about it as different intelligences or use the metaphor of a, of a symphony orchestra, my, one of my sisters happens to manage one, um, you know, that we, all of us are, none of us are strong at everything and that that's not a, a possible human ideal or aspiration and maybe even not a worthy one. Um, what makes us unique is the particular things, the, the, the mixture of things that we're strong at and, um, and so on. So in, in any case, the, the difference of a maturity model, which tends to be linear normative, as opposed to say intelligences or other, I'm sure there's other framings that are more of a meta level that allows people, there's less challenging. And then for me, at least that the, the intelligence frame allows has, by not being judgmental, it allows people, I think more freedom and choice to say, I may not be strong at that, but I want to be strong at it. It's just, a, I found it a more liberating mm -hmm. framing, but I'm not an expert in, you know, uh, adult development and the, all the maturity stuff. I'm really curious. But, but it, it's a great question because I read a book this summer from Robert Sternberg on metaphors of intelligence, because he looked at, you know, what are the root metaphors that are used in different a uh, whole development, you know, whole fields of understanding what intelligence is and how do those then shape the discourse and narrow the lenses around it. Yeah. So it is always choices that we make for utility in different contexts. And, and of course, when you start out, you often get exposed to one way of talking about it. And then that becomes the way in the gospel. And then eventually you bump into the limitations and might start adopting other discourses and metaphors and eventually start to be able to kind of listen for clues about which metaphors are going to have which impact in which context. 
Is there a way to, well, the term that actually came to mind, and I'll use it, so it's a strong term, but detoxify the discourse of maturity to, to allow it to not be toxic. I mean, you can, of course, appeal to people's maturity that they <laughs> might be able to, and, and they're, you know, to, to, to recognize that they might not be mature. There's a whole paradox in there and that they might want to become more mature. But that's a big ask for many, many people. So how do you work with maturity in a way that doesn't by itself almost, you know, create barriers the, the moment you use the term? Well, it's like race. I mean, would we ask to detoxify the discourse on race? Um, and so while I really like the idea of trying to get a discourse that gets into people and does, because maturity does create barriers, there's a part of me, and it's the belligerent and difficult part that says, damn it, people must have some stamina to learn to deal with the difficult stuff in life. But that's me. Um, and that's, that's purely informed by a South African context in a rather a bullish personality. I guess what I would just what I would just observe is, and maybe others are observing it too. I don't know, but the um, the power of language, you know, like how do we? It's possible that all of us sitting here are defining maturity in different different terms, um, even though it may have a, a master definition that can become a barrier. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just, I love this because I was reflecting on, okay, well, how do I define maturity? What does that concept in my mind look like? I started to have some answers, but what, what, what immediately came to mind was at first, I didn't really have one. I, I really wasn't conscious of what I meant when I was using the word maturity. Uh, so it just, it comes back to this language as having been, as being so, um, potentially uh, empowering and also um, not so much. <laughs> the other comment I would just make on, the other comment I would just make, you know, is that um, uh, this really great tie-in between Myers-Briggs and, and uh, so-called, you know, meaning-making maturity that I find really interesting in my work with, with folks is the integration of these different functions, mm -hmm. like thinking and feeling in the Myers-Briggs where uh, further along in people's development, adult development, they start to integrate the J and the P, they start to integrate the T and the F. And I guess for me, what that means is that is a sign of maturation or integration. I think of integration as almost synonymous with maturation, a reach for a greater wholeness, mm -hmm. uh, given all of our complexity. That's where I've landed. Yeah. And, and this is the whole construct aware thing. We realize that we make choices and we implicitly load constructs. So for me, the term maturity was one I used because the book that I edited, I, we titled it Maturing Leadership and use that partly because developing leadership has a whole set of connotations about developmental ladders and hierarchies, for, for instance. So maturing was a move to try and have a more generic, softer term. Um, th th there's all sorts of things that are possible around that. And just being aware that the metaphors implied in the language we use will have diverse responses or triggers in different audiences. Okay, let's like go to, for it, Julia. Should we just go, go for it? it? Okay. So I've paired people up. I've tried to, there's too many students to have only one in a room. So there are some pairing spaces and some people have left. So um, I am actually, I was thinking of um, trying to keep it to three people, but I'm going to quickly move the, these two. Um, oh, what? Well, while she's doing that, basically we just thought it would be nice at the end to just do a little speed checkout. Yeah. Just, you know, what have you taken from the conversation? What do you want to share? What connections do you want to make? And the idea would be to do a, maybe a couple rounds of this. So we've created some rooms, give you a few minutes to just kind of check out and connect. And then 
will come back for just saying goodbye, basically. So we could do two rounds of that, Julia? Yeah, so five minutes each? Yep, Some, or cool. say four minutes. We need four two minutes. minutes to just say goodbye. Five. Two minutes, four minutes. Okay. It's ready, go. Go. Oh. Jonathan, I've put you in a room. Sorry, did he put me in a room as well? No, but I did. Um, Hugh didn't disappeared. Me. So no one's missing out on checking out. No, that's very interesting. Okay. Uh, Hugh disappeared. That person? Yeah. Hi. Sorry, I'm just... Sending off something. You know, um, we're still recording. Yeah. Okay. I think big thanks to uh, Julia and Andrea for setting this up and hosting us. Yeah, this is, isn't this the thing jazz everybody does now? You go, Jonathan's jazz hand. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, Really, thanks everybody for showing up and engaging. I think it was a great conversation. I'm really looking forward to hearing about it on the 29th from the students in my class, what, what reflections and connections you made and, and sharing some of that with the rest of class. Um, and maybe we'll make this an annual thing. I hope so. It's been yes. And if there's anything we can do in terms of providing email addresses or connections to please let us know. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for bringing your students. Thank you, students. And thank you, the F4M Network, for coming. Thanks, next everybody. Week, we're going to invite so you all next week. It's, it's on curiosity. Um, so please come. We'll send the, the note. Thank you all so right. much, Jonathan. And then perhaps you could share it with the network if anyone's interested in joining, because I don't yep. have your email address. Do. Yep. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so Thanks, much. Everyone. Thanks, Thank Jonathan. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.